Hey, hello. So last month on the 30th of July, I was invited to give a short talk to share about my stories from the jungle. Uh, and it's basically stories of the antics I've seen people get to in nature, be it casual hikers or nature photographers. And you know, if you've missed the chance to come down live to watch the talk, don't worry, I've got it all recorded down. So sit back, relax, and if you're ready, let's go. Firstly, uh, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to Park Provisions. Uh, it's this wonderful cafe over here um, and no, thank you Park, I don't know if they can hear me uh, but thank you Park for help, uh, having me here and inviting me for this talk and uh, you know, it's a very wonderful cosy space as you can see by how I'm sitting right now uh, so if you ever want to come by again to have some coffee or some uh, you know, food feel free to stop by again and uh, enjoy our time here and uh, so let's begin you know, welcome to our small little casual talk called our impatient nature. Okay, so uh, firstly, I, I, I do see quite a number of familiar faces, um, but you know, some of you I, I'm not familiar as well. So if you don't know who I am, I am Feng Shan, and I run a small little YouTube channel called Little Red Jungle. So just a, sh a short little uh, montage. I finally found the grey crown crane. So the sun barely just set and then we already found uh, the buffy fish owl and it's actually a critically endangered owl in Singapore. And this here is the elephant ear plant, also known as the taro. And because they are super lightweight and stringy, it is very easy for them to catch on and be carried off by air currents. Very abrupt ending, but <laughs> uh, okay. Yeah, so um, that is just a, a, a you know short little montage of, of the channel and, and what kind of videos I create. Uh, but maybe let's first start with uh, you know my journey, right? So to give you a bit a bit of a context as to how I started this nature YouTube channel um, and you know how this whole thing came to be. So my love for nature first started with this. Okay, so. Interaction uh, with a race of hands. How many of you were forced to buy either Net Geo or uh, Reader's Digest in secondary school? I have, right? Okay, good, good. <laughs> uh, so, same, that's how I, I, I got um, these books. It's to read during morning assembly. Oh, it's you. I, I, I didn't recognize you without your spectacles. Oh my god, sorry. Okay. <laughs> uh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, I, I got this to read during morning assembly. Uh, and just like that, inspired. So, what's the key message? You need to force kids to read more books. Okay, I'm kidding. Uh, but okay, so these books, alongside um, of my secondary school bio teacher, um, they really were my first step into nature. Um, and so I actually went to study media in Poly to try to find a, to, or to try to get a job in Net Geo. Clearly very inspired. Um, but as the years went by, things kind of shifted, and I found myself, um, you know, in uni jumping from media to biology. Um, and in that course of my, my uni studies, I took a lot of ecology modules. Right, so these are some of the wonderful field work I did in uni. Uh, lots of plants, lots of grass, um, and uh, actually if you see in my YouTube video, I do try to sneak in uh, lots of plants to kind of inspire people to, to, to like the same thing. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so through you know, all of my ecology modules, I did realize that you know, there's a lot of nature in Singapore that most Singaporeans don't know about. Right? And, to be honest, if I didn't take those modules to begin with, uh, I wouldn't have known that all these things existed also, lah, right? Uh, and so, I, I, what I wanted to do was to marry two of my educational uh, backgrounds together, and thus Little Red Jungle was born. Okay, so, you know, on, on the channel, I do try to... Oh, lots of people. <laughs> <laughs> so on the, on the channel, I do try to feature or, or spotlight Singapore's often overlooked plants and animals like all of these over here. Some you might have seen before, like very obviously crocodiles and, and stuff, but some birds, some of you may not know, of. Um, and even though Singapore, we are trying to brand ourselves as a city in nature, um, like I said, I think the average Singaporean don't really know fully the wildlife side of, of our country. Right? And how do you expect our citizens to try to protect our plants and animals when they don't even know what we have? Right? And the thing is, our wildlife definitely, definitely needs protecting um, because we are a very small country. Right? And we are, everyone's fighting for space, so there will be a lot of overlaps between man and wild. But for me, I personally like to think that nature is inevitable and persistent and resilient. Um, and whatever chance they can find 
I feel like nature will try to regain a space to live in, right? As long as there's a space, they will start to grow back again. So for today's very casual sharing, I'm coming in um, with a little twist, right? Nature is very impatient to grow back. But what about us humans? I think we can say the same for us as well, right? We are pretty impatient. So that is kind of like the uh, overarching theme for it all. Okay, another uh, raise of hands before we actually go to the, the, the sharing session proper. How many of you have hiked in our parks or nature reserves before? Or have I right, got no one has never hiked before, right? Okay, so I, I think uh, a lot of the things that I would say, I think maybe you all can relate better. Like, I don't need to break it down so simply for you guys. Okay, so uh, I'm basically going to share some stories of the antics that I've seen Singaporeans get into when they're out in nature, right? Because to make a nature YouTube video, you need to camp at a certain place in the jungle for hours and to be honest, for many days, sometimes even weeks. Um, and, you know, it, it's a perfect opportunity for us to see some very interesting characters. And the intention of the talk is really just that because yes, all of us here hike, but I feel like when we hike, it's often in a very short time frame and we keep the experience within ourselves or with, with our friends. And sometimes we don't notice the weird things that people get into. Right? We're, we're too busy talking to our friends or, or looking at, nature's, uh, at nature ourselves. Um, and so we may miss uh, the unfortunate parts of having this human nature overlap. Okay? So I just want to shed some light on what's actually happening. Interpret them however you want. Uh, and maybe you can have an open platform to discuss after the sharing. So uh, if you have any questions, just keep it to the end. Okay, and I'm going to split the talk into two main categories. Okay, I promise I talk a lot at starting early. Okay, <laughs> first one, casual hikers caught in the act. And number two, nature photographers caught in the act. Okay, just these two very broad categories. So first one, before I play the video, okay, you all know what this animal is, right? It's a long-tailed macaque. It's just a, the very common monkey that we have. Um, and when you watch the video, uh, I just want you to pay attention to the body language of the monkey and uh, try to notice the sudden shifts in uh, the attention of the mother monkey. Okay? <laughs> so... <laughs> What you just saw uh, are two macaques, right? A mom and a baby, very cute. Suddenly the mother ran away, right? So what you couldn't see off frame was that there was actually a human mother and her kid and her kid really wanted to eat some biscuit. I could hear from her farm, Mama, mommy, I'm hungry. So very on theme, very impatient. She needs to eat now. So what did the mother do? She took a plastic bag out of her bag with biscuits and passed it to the little girl. And um, you know, I think everyone knows that plastic bag is very noisy, right? So the thing is, for the macaques, all of them, they recognize that plastic sound, right? Uh, whenever someone brings food into the forest, usually in plastic, and it becomes like a, a habitual thing, right? You hear the sound, you know there's food that is going to come, right? Because macaques are very um, fast learners. Uh, yeah, so what happened was the mother macaque, she just ditched her baby, if you can see. Uh, the baby will fall down later, by the way. I don't know if you guys noticed. Yeah, look, look at where the baby is, he'll drop down. Ready, ready, oh, he dropped, okay. <laughs> uh, and yeah, so he just ditched the baby and went to chase after the human kid. And of course, the mother, the human mother, in response was grab the kid and run. And I think they dropped one biscuit or two. And the funny part to me is the, the juxtaposition. The mother was clearly let screw the falling baby and chase the biscuit. <laughs> and the human was screw the biscuit, grab the child, right? Uh, so I, I, I find it quite funny, but yes, the thing is, ultimately, this monkey chase human trick works uh, because ultimately, like I said, they dropped one biscuit or two and it's still very easy food for the mother macaque and her baby, correct? So like I, uh, I, I think maybe I'll pop this question to all of you guys, two questions. How do you think that changed the way macaques behave? And secondly, uh, equally important as well, the girl was maybe around six to seven years old, right? How does such an interaction mold her and affect her view of nature as she grows up, right? Having a monkey chase after you. Uh, so that's just something for you guys to think about. Okay, but it's also not just plastic bags because where we throw our food at the parks is a whole other fun issue. So here, uh, another group of monkeys.
uh, you might want to uh, uh, yeah Okay, it's gonna loop again. Feel free to watch as I talk. Okay, so this one was a really intense scenario for me. So this was at the old main bridge at Sungai Buloh Nature Reserve. Uh, they made a new one already, so this specific one doesn't exist anymore. Um, but it's basically the only way in and out of the migrating bird trail. And you look at my, my show notes. <laughs> migrating bird trail if you've ever been there before. Uh, you all got to go to Sungai Buloh before, right? Okay, yes. So, and so as I was going back home, I ne needed to take that trail. And Hence, I needed to go on that bridge, correct? And so I saw this wonderful scene of the monkeys ransacking the dustbin. And I felt, okay, la, perfect opportunity, let's just go and film, <laughs> right? Smart, smart me. So, uh, I don't know how they found, I don't know how they know that there was a, a, a packet of bread in there. La. They probably saw someone throw it inside the bin. And again, I said monkeys very smart, they found a way to open it up, take it, and, and went in for the kill. So, in order to go past them, what I did was to slowly walk, I avoided eye contact, I just be very casual about walking past them. Uh, and so I, I found a space close enough to film them, but also to not make them feel threatened. But as you can see, there was a couple who walked by, um, and if I remember correctly, the girl was very scared. Uh, I think when you see them running also, you can see the girl kind of pulling her away, correct? Uh, pulling the, the guy away. Um, and I mean, it's okay to be scared of monkeys, nothing wrong, no, no, no shade to the girl. But the guy, if you saw, he was taking his phone out and really stuffing it to the, the monkey's face. Especially the monkey at the other end, when I pan out, uh, you'll see. Uh. Okay, so, um, and what I saw was that that macaque that was off frame, it was trying to pounce on the guy's face already. And the thing was, okay, I think, I, I, I don't know why this is a thing, but when the girl was scared, the guy had to act macho. <laughs> like, the guy was like, oh, okay, okay, okay. And like, really tried to like, get in front and, and like, like, protect the girl. And I don't know why protect means stuff like pushing the camera to the monkey's face. Um, but when the monkey showed the teeth, he tried to turn back. And so I really saw the monkey was on the ledge and he was really about to pounce. And to be honest, it was the girl that saved him la, because the girl pulled, pulled him away. <laughs> so uh, I don't know who is helping who. Uh, but yeah, so at that point, I, I, it would be hard for me to shift the camera because I was looking at the scenario and I was a bit scared. Um, and uh, so till today, I actually share this story because it's so important for Singaporeans to know how to act around wildlife, correct? Um, like, okay, I get it. If you need to go home now, now, sure. But I think we kind of need to teach people on the do's and don'ts on, for example, macaques, right? How do we walk past them without agitating them, right? And for me, it's to avoid eye contact. Um, and I think NPARKs, they do have signs on what to do. I think they have infographics online as well. But to be honest, how many of you actually read the, <laughs> the stuff? I don't think any of you read, lah, right? So what else can we do right, to, to help stop such incidents from happening? And it's not just macaques. You guys might think, okay, monkeys very smart, ma, so they are an exception. Well, to be honest, in Singapore, we do have a lot of smart animals around. So take, for example, So, very cute. You see hornbills peeking into someone's toilet. To be honest, I don't know if it's toilet or bedroom because I never peek inside myself. But it seems like toilet. Lah. Okay, so the birds like these, they're actually very smart. And they will also tend to change their behavior based on what's happening around them. Right, so I think for a period of time, there was a news article of an uncle at Loyang Coffee Shop. <laughs> it was at a Loyang Coffee Shop feeding the hornbills bananas. Do, do, do you all remember that news article? Right? So I think at first people were like, oh, so cute. But then some people started to bring it up that, started to bring up that it was a problem. Then in the end, he got fined, correct? So a very similar thing happened on that same day I filmed this 
uh, this footage. And what happened was, I was with a friend, uh, we had lots of gear, and this auntie came out to, uh, came out to us to ask, hey, what are you filming? Are you from Mediacorp? Uh, firstly, uh, thank you for thinking that I'm from Mediacorp, I'm uh, sure. <laughs> but no, I told her that we were, fil we were filming home builds for hobby. Hobby, we just say hobby like easier. Okay? And when I told her that, she actually tried to invite me and my friend to her house. And the reason being is because she said, hey, actually, uh, every day got home build fly to my house, I will feed them banana, uh, not banana, I'll feed them fruits one lap. And um, I mean, okay. Kind gesture, thanks for trying to help two strangers out in, in filming home builds for a hobby. Um, and when someone tells you things like that, a bit hard to reprimand her, right? Like, you're trying to, she's trying to help you and they say, Auntie, hey, actually cannot, why you feed the home build? It's a bit, I was in a bit of a weird situation. Um, and sadly, I just said no thank you because I, I didn't know how to, to, to scold her. Okay, scold her isn't the right word to use, but I think you get what I'm trying to say. Um, and the thing is, home builds, you feed them one time they're going to form this habit and they're going to keep coming to her place, correct? And the thing with animals is you, they don't reckon, I won't say don't recognize your face, but they see humans as humans, right? They don't discriminate, oh, this auntie can, this auntie cannot, right? So you'll notice that a lot of animals tend to test the water, right? They go to this house, can then maybe try next house, lah, right? So that's unfortunately the natural outcome of when humans creep into nature spaces and then nature creeping back in. The thing is, we want to clear more forests to build more BTOs, correct? But when we build BTOs over the forest, we create a lot of human nature overlap. And things like the brass stealing and the, the bird eating might happen. And it's very easy to say, I just say, oh, don't build BTOs, but there are a lot of layers to this, right? Because it's a fact that we do need to consider our citizens. Lesser HDBs means more expensive HDBs. And People like myself included, I don't have one million to buy a HDB flat. Lah. Okay, so it's very complex. And as much as I want people, you know, including all of you, to champion and to support nature conservation, it's not so straightforward. I, and I'm not here to just take one side. Okay? And okay, I think I've painted uh, animals in the past three stories as a very aggressive thing. So I want to show you a different perspective as well. Animals can also be the victims. So one more, just one more video for this section. Uh, look at the lakes. Yeah. Okay, so quite straightforward. I think you guys know what's happening. Uh, so if you've watched my macaque episode, which was quite early on, uh, to be honest, um, you'll probably, probably recognize this three-legged monkey. Um, and it's very likely because of a car accident. And, you know, sometimes monkeys just need to cross the road, lah, right? Be it to get to the other side, or sometimes, to be honest, they do steal food from cars as well. So, th thankfully, this monkey was okay when I was filming. It was very healthy, it was still very energetic, was playing with the other monkeys. But it's not always the case for animals who get into car accidents, right? And so I'm going to break the pacing a little bit. I'm going to show you a video from Acres, um, and I think it really wonderfully summarize uh, it summarizes all of the the stories that i've talked about and um so just sit back sit back relax and enjoy the short video okay um and so now we've reached part two of the session um where it is nature photographers caught in the act um so you might think that okay just now casual hikers if they make mistake it's under understandable right they only hike once per month sure right everyone's still learning but you would think that, okay, if you're a ph photographer camping there seven hours for four days a week, you would know your stuff, right? And that's what you think. Because today we're gonna, uh, now we're going to talk about the ethics of online nature content and maybe for you guys to think, how did the photo that you see online come to be? Okay? So, this first video is a crocodile um, and nothing juicy. But what I really want to share is what happened before I came into this position. Oh, by the way, I, I waited for like an hour and a half before this guy yawned. So I was just standing there with mosquitoes uh, until this guy yawned. So anyway, uh, when I saw this crocodile, I was walking along Sungai Bolo and I saw an older uncle. He was holding up his phone camera to this direction. So basically what he did was he took the pebbles at Sungai Bolo and started to throw at the crocodile. And it was to get the attention 
of the crocodile to, to move lah for the photo. And all I, I mean, you guys will know where this is going, but firstly, I want to say thank you, uncle, for helping me spot the crocodile because they're not very easy to spot. <laughs> but that's not the point. <laughs> the thing is, um, if you have been to Sungai Below, you'll know that the only thing protecting you and the crocodile is a very short wooden fence. Correct? And although, yes, the crocodile was actually quite a distance away, so my lens was very long, um, but you are still potentially going to first hurt a wild animal that is clearly just resting. Right? And, and, and a second part of it is that it's an apex predator. What makes you think it won't get triggered and start running towards you if it wants to? Right? So you're not only putting the animal in danger, but yourself and the people around you as well. And all of this pebble throwing was just for him to take a video on his phone. So I don't know how worth it it was. I don't know what kind of Google handphone it was. Like. Maybe some high-tech phone, uh, quality very good. But when he saw me walking towards him, he stopped doing what he was doing and he walked away. So this clearly means that he knows that it's wrong, right? Or else why did he stop? Um, and that's the essence of what this whole section is about, ethics in photography. Because every time when you see a photo, you only see the end product. You don't see the process of it. Um, and unfortunately, when you talk about ethics, it's a bit grey, right? There are certain things that are definitely wrong, definitely right, but there are also things where it's debatable, not so clear-cut. So take for uh, an instance, this footage I took of uh, the mangrove pita. <laughs> Go the other side and call him. So basically, what's happening is this. Apparently, it's a very rare resident bird. It's called the mangrove pita, um, and it's actually near threatened. And I think you already saw the captions or heard what the uncles were saying. They were playing uh, audio recordings of the bird call to attract the bird out. So for this one, to the public, or I don't know, maybe even you guys feel the same way, you might think it's very harmless. Who thinks it's harmless? <laughs> Well, not bad at all. Okay, all, all got. <laughs> if you're coming, I think you all should know where this is going. Lah. Okay, so um, to a lot of people, it's just sound. And yes, it's just sound. But for all of you guys, do you know exactly what you're playing or what the bird call is playing? It could maybe be a mating call. right? It could be a potential competitor who is trying to uh, take over this specific space. The thing is, I don't know. I, I don't speak in PETA. Uh, and <laughs> but what's happening is, this bird is leaving the safety of its hiding spot to check this sound out, right? Because the bird call probably triggered some natural instincts. And what's happening is, is um, this bird is on heightened alert. It's trying to find a mate or find its competitor. But the thing is, it, it doesn't see anything despite hearing a bird call, right? So think about how, imagine if someone is in your, in your bedroom shouting, Sean, 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 you look around, you don't see anybody, you feel very stressed, right? Same thing for the bird, right? You're hearing something, but you don't see anything. And not only that, we are bringing it out to the open. The bird, very colourful, right? It's a clear target for, for example, a, a much larger, you know, bird-eating predator, right? It's a target. Uh, and I'm not coming up with theories. So, this thing has actually been studied before, right? People have done the research and it is an actual problem. And the thing is sometimes, okay, you see the uncles just now, there were multiple photographers, uncles, you, you see that they have a deep passion for something, right? How do you tell them, hey, uncle, must you really play sound? A bit bad, right? Uh, even if you do, a lot of them will have the response as, it's just sound, what? And I think it's also very weird to start bombarding, hey, uncle, you see this scientific art article? A bit, <laughs> a bit stupid, right? Um, so it is, again, an issue that is so layered and grey because the general public thinks it's no big deal. Right, okay, here's another grey issue, okay? All of you recognize this Mandarin duck? It was very uh, famous for a period of time, right? So there were many articles of this duck, but if you actually read the text, you'll see this, right? Throwing rice, throwing pebbles, okay? So again, people, I don't know, they were either trying to feed it or to lure it for the camera, and just like my crocodile, crocodile stories, people were throwing pebbles as well. 
Um, but here's the question for all of you guys. What's the line to be drawn? Rocks cannot throw. Cannot throw at crocodile, cannot throw at bird. But one piece of bread can or not? Right? And then, what if you accidentally drop? <laughs> right? How do you set rules around that? Right? And, and furthermore, who is to help monitor? So for this Mandarin duck, everyone at that period of time knew where it was. Aokang, this drain in Aokang. Okay? But the thing is, for the pita, the one with the, the bird call, I didn't even know that I could find them there. Right? So how do you get an authority or security, uh, security guard to camp there to make sure that people are acting ethically? How do you do that, right? So I think the onus is twofold. On one end, for photographers and you know, uh, videographers and content creators, I think, uh, and, and this is more for myself, like, I mean, if you guys take photos too, sure. But uh, we need to make use of our community and platform to really lead by example and to advise each other on maybe not what's wrong or, or, or right, but what's maybe a better way to do things. Some people may listen, some don't, but I think it's still a net positive because there are still some people who do. Right? And on the, on the other hand, all of you, right, the people using social media, right, we need to also try to maybe follow the ethical content creators. Say very easy, lah. I mean, how would you suss out whether this guy is ethical or not? But I mean, through time, maybe through uh, observing how the photos come out, you might be able to do so. Um, and to be honest, I get it even, I have made that mistake before. Right? I, 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 I have you know, misjudged an Instagram account, for example. And, and I think, we're all still learning and trying to figure things out better, right? But I think at least if you agree with what I shared today, I think all of us are in a maybe right step forward, uh, moving ahead. Okay, yeah, so like I said, uh, all these stories, it's really just to show you what's happening out there in the real world. Um, the power ultimately is still in your hands. Be it knowing what to do in nature, trying to understand the effects of this human-wildlife uh, overlap, or you know, um, choosing the right creator to follow online. Okay, it may seem small, like your power itself may seem small as compared to the government. But you know, I, I think we all have to remember that we have our own circle of influence, right? And maybe what can that do? Especially the children, right? Remember I said the children and the, the, the child in, in the first story. Um, the children are always looking and observing what exactly do we want to, what exactly do we want to teach our kids um, when we have to live beside nature, right? And um, some of you may think that humans are separate from animals. Uh, you know, we are mammals, but we are not animals. You know, I'm pretty sure you've heard that, that, that before. Um, but I think, okay, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not here to have that debate, but I think what makes humans different is that we have complex reasoning. We have the ability to introspect, we can take responsibility, right? So in a place like Singapore, what is our next step forward? Can we actually control our impatience? Or are we just like the plants and animals and we have no control over what may seem like our nature? Uh, and, and yeah, I think that's all for today. That's, my, that's, that's me trying to act like a dolphin, by the way, pink dolphin. So before we go, I'd like to thank a few people. Firstly, all of you for coming by. Okay, I would also like to thank Jessica, our interpreter. Uh, Zach, our camera crew, he's helping to film this. Don't worry, not your face your face not inside. <laughs> it's for me to post on YouTube. <laughs> and uh, I would also like to thank Park Provisions, Heather and Serene for inviting me to have this sharing session. Uh, so please do check the photos out uh, at the back if you, you know, want to be more immersed in this experience. Um, and no, I just want to say that it's really fun to be here to share these stories with you. Uh, and if you haven't already, please subscribe to Little Red Jungle. Uh, that's all. Okay, bye-bye. <laughs> Thank you.